Okay, well, welcome everyone to our fourth session <laughs> of the Student Experience Conference. And today we'll have quite a few speakers, so we'll just get started on that. The first three speakers we will have today are uh, firstly, Dr. Vidya with Jay Retna, and she's a senior lecturer in networks at QMUL and the director of teaching for the joint program with BUPT. And her key research interests lie in network con congestion control and quality of experience. Vinya has been teaching on the JP since 2008, and she's currently teaching communications and networks to UG students at QMUL and Java programming to JP students at BU, uh, BUPT. She's a senior fellow of Higher Education Academy. And after her will be Dr. Alan, and he's a lecturer at the School of Electronic Engineering and Computer Science at Queen Mary University of London, UK. His research interests are in the areas of wireless communications and its emerging applications and verticals. He is also interested in advanced technology enabled education research, such as AI, blockchain, AR, VR, and education, educational games for interactive learning, and so on. Dr. Alam is an IEE member and associate fellow of Higher Education Academy in UK. And lastly, we have Dr. Ethan Law, and he's a lecturer in the Internet of Things at QMUL. One of Ethan's prior research involves the pedagogic modeling settings that aims to improve the quality of teaching and learning within universities. His other research interests include mathematical and behavioral modeling, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. So without further ado, yeah, I'll hand it over to you, Vinya. And Thank you, Christine. Um, hope everyone can hear me and see me. I'm going to share my slides then. Yeah, hope everyone can see that. Brilliant. Yes, Thank you so much. It. All right. OK, so this is on uh, some practical approaches that we are employ for teaching and learning on the Queen Mary University of London and Beijing University of Post and Telecommunications joint program through a couple of case studies that will be presented by my colleagues, um, Alam and Ethan. So I will give a kind of um, brief overview of our program and um, what today's talk is about. Then I will hand over to my colleagues. Then I will uh, come back at the end for a brief conclusion. So, oh, yeah, see, so uh, I think I pressed it just too much. Okay, so our program was established in 2004. So um, it's quite, um, you know, um, we, we've been running it for a number of years. And currently we've got over 2,500 students in total. And that's across three um, degree programs. They're all BSc engineering uh, programs in telecoms, and, um, and Internet of Things and also um, um, e-commerce engineering with law. So these are the three uh, streams and we've got 680 students in one cohort and then we've got it's a four year degree program. So our programs are fully accredited by the Institution of uh, Engineering and Technology, the IET, the same institution that accredits um, the programs that we run uh, back in UK. And also, um, we also um, also get regularly audited by the um, Quality Assurance um, Agency in um, UK for higher education. So they also um, go over and review our programs. And you can see a picture of um, one of our graduations, I think it's back from 2019. So last year, obviously, we didn't have quite the same due to the pandemic, but um, usually it's a, it's a very nice time. So, um, then a little bit about what we've been doing uh, for years since about 2004, we've always had the flying faculty model. So we fly over there, it's in block teaching. So each of us will go there for one week, teach one module, then come back and then students will do other modules um, during the other weeks. And then in about another three weeks time, we will go back. So there's four weeks of um, block teaching, four blocks per module per semester. Um, so on average, um, each one of us would fly in something like six times, six, seven times a year, uh, but these are spread um, throughout the year. Plus, we will also go for the final year viva and then try to go for graduation as well. Um, so that's the modules taught by us. So it's roughly um, taught 50-50 by us and BUPT. 
So uh, the BUPT modules will be taught on a weekly um, model because the lecturers are obviously based there. Um, and uh, so in addition, uh, in the final year, students, although they can get the entire uh, degree, so they will get dual degree, they can get it uh, entirely based in China, but they do have the option of coming um, to UK and studying within Queen Mary for their final year as well. So a small number of students do come, which again, is not going to happen um, this September due to the pandemic. So, um, and the virtual platforms that we use, um, they are um, called QM Plus, but this is actually Moodle. So QM Plus is our customized version of Moodle, okay? So QM Plus is the main platform and there are some associated platforms such as the QM Plus Hub, which is a nice um, little tool that you can use for group work and some of our colleagues actually make use of that. So, What's happening now is the current module delivery has been slightly different. So we are no longer, we've not been able to go there since um, the semester one of 2019-20. So um, currently, so last year we, uh, because it was very last minute, we just carried on our teaching in the same block model and we just delivered things remotely. But when it came to semester one this year, then we had time to plan and we had carefully worked out what's best. And um, so the best um, arrangement that um, it, it, that turned out to be was a weekly teaching model uh, with the blended learning. So we're gonna do, uh, we do asynchronous and synchronous sessions. So live sessions and um, recorded sessions intermingled um, in different patterns that suit different model modules. So I'm showing an example here. So we have four slots per week per module, and some of this will be live, some of this will be recorded. So this is a snapshot of um, part of the timetable that we uh, released to students. This is actually from a module that um, I'm teaching today uh, as well. Um, so you can, the students can see the times and everything over here and whether the sessions are live or recorded. So if it's recorded, we post them up on Echo360 and students are able to just weave it on a browser or um, on their mobile app. But in addition to that, we actually play these in the classroom now. So they can actually come to the classroom and watch these recorded sessions. Or if it's a live session, we uh, display our video in the classroom, just like you can um, see in the picture. So we have a good system of um, teaching assistants on the ground. There is a teaching assistant in every classroom to set things up and help us communicate um, with the students. So we use um, a number of tools. So this has been the same setup since September. So we did it in semester one and we're continuing that setup in semester two with some improvements. So as you can see here, we use Microsoft Teams for the main um, lectures and tutorials, the live um, sessions. Um, you can see an example with um, Ethan there from Ethan's module. And then on the right hand side, you can see Mentimeter, which has become extremely popular um, for students to ask questions. Um, so as you know, I think I heard this in previous sessions as well. Uh, with Chinese students, they tend to ask less questions if, they're, um, if it's not anonymous. So Mentimeter is completely anonymous. So the interaction has been actually much better than when we were face-to-face -face in some cases. So they've been asking, so not only just the polling, we also use the question and answer slide on Mentimeter. So constantly students can use it to um, ask us questions. So that slide is always on um, when we lecture. And on the bottom left, you can see um, another, um, and this is Microsoft Whiteboard. So in addition to do displaying the slides, we use the Microsoft Whiteboard um, app uh, in order to uh, write things on the board. And on the bottom right, you can see an example of Jamboard. So this is a Google app. So this, this can be used um, interactively, but because it's a Google-based one, we don't use it that way. It's only to kind of display. Um, there's also other things like concept map tools and things like that. So anything that's, um, because we are not there, we try to sort of, you know, the engagement of students is um, very challenging. So here's what we are going to talk about in the 
case studies as well. So over the uh, past few months, we've sort of tried and tested several things and come to um, you know this sort of um, setup. So these are the live lectures, tutorials, and office hours. We do everything on uh, Microsoft Teams. So um, to, to show the concept that we um, actually follow. So this is the flipped classroom or blended learning approach with, you can identify uh, different parts of this. So the pre-classroom activities would be via the pre-recordings that we provide. So students should um, watch these recordings and in some of these recordings, we embed quizzes as well for them to do, to understand concepts and extra material for them to refer to. And then during the lecture, we have the Mentimeter and all this, because some of them have little problem-based learning exercises, little group activities and things like that, which are then supported by the TAs on the ground. And um, then also there are some other practical exercises as well. So we have labs in um, quite a few of our modules, our practical modules. So these labs are again supported by um, teaching assistants um, on the ground. So um, for student feedback mechanisms, so we've had obviously the standard mechanisms always like the staff student liaison committee, which meets twice a semester. And we also have what we call um, module revs. So this is um, kind of thing we have had it um, for a few years again now. This is where in order to get a little bit more immediate feedback um, compared to the staff student liaison committee. So we uh, appoint a couple of module reps for each module um, who are appointed by the module organizer. And their role is not to wait till the staff student liaison committee, just even every day or at least every week talk to the lecturer and give some immediate feedback, the font's too small or too fast or whatever it is, so we can rectify things quickly. So these two we've had um, uh, for a number of years. What we've started within the last year during the pandemic time is these last three things, which are the monthly student focus groups, which has been really, really useful because as SSLC is a little bit formal, this focus group, we keep a little bit informal. There's no agenda or anything. It's just few of us and the students, they just, um, you know, obviously virtually, and they just really talk to us about any, um, so any student is welcome, but mostly it's the reps that turn up. And they, they tend to really um, speak up uh, in these sessions compared to SSLC. Then we also ran a QM plus student survey, and this was um, actually uh, initiated by our um, other uh, Nanchang um, joint program in Queen Mary. So we ran this, we have three joint programs in Queen Mary. So all three programs ran the exact same survey to find out how this online learning experience has been for the students. So on the right hand side, you can see a snapshot of some of the questions. So this was again, quite useful in getting some solid um, feedback about what's right and what's wrong um, in, the, in our current setup. So last year in 2019 semester two, we ran this twice, one mid semester, one at the end of the semester. And then again, this semester, we, uh, we ran the same survey then to allow us to compare. And I'll um, tell you in a minute what we found out. And another thing we started doing was the staff weekly drop-in session. So I started as director of teaching for this program. I started running this drop-in session. That's really been useful. And again, for the staff, we're not seeing each other down the corridor anymore, right? So this has been the place that just drop by. It's optional, but most of us who are teaching just come by. They say, you know, how, how do you share this on MS Teams? How uh, my Mentimeter got stuck? And this, how do you, let's really sort of, you know, get together, discuss problems, discuss ideas, how to really improve. And uh, my student attendance has gone down. What do you think? And they say, oh, they had this test today, blah, blah, blah. This kind of, so it was very, um, so it's still going since last semester, we meet every Friday and have a good natter, joke about, and sort of, you know, um, yeah, just for the staff to get together. So um, the feedback that we gathered, so from student focus groups and SSLC and also the student survey that we ran on QM+. So last semester, we had a whole plethora of technical issues. 
So this was the you know, first time we were doing and students were at home all over China. So all kinds of network issues. And also we weren't actually using Teams last year. We were using Blackboard Collaborate. I don't know if others are familiar. This, this is um, attached to, this can be run through Moodle, a QM plus. And you know, there was so many issues, students couldn't join very smoothly. So loads and loads of issues. Um, but these seem to have um, mostly or almost all um, resolved now because we've been through such a lot of testing. We've had a whole team of volunteers of academics and our administrators doing an amazing job just testing and pre-testing everything. So these seem to have gone down to give an example um, in the free flow comments when we first ran the survey, 35% of the comments were on technical issues. And then the second time we ran it, which was at the end of um, the semester in 2019, 20, this was 11%. And in the latest one, it's actually 0%. So no one complained about the technical issue. So we can actually see that for ourselves, things are going really smoothly. And now obviously students are on campus. So obviously the network connection is much better. And we've also learned so much about these tools and how to use them and we've become a bit of experts in all this. Um, so I think that that side is going well. So we didn't um, need to look into it further, touch wood for now. So what's the other kind of main feedbacks have been? So last semester, so this year in the first semester, we, um, so out of the 40 slots, we did about half of them, about 20 live sessions and the other half recorded. So students seemed to, so we found for the recorded sessions, the attendance wasn't great, but the live sessions was good. And it's just, students actually preferred live sessions. They were asking for this. And also, um, so what we've done this semester is increase the proportion of uh, live sessions a lot more. And also the students wanted to have the recordings of live lectures as well, so I guess they can review. We didn't do this in the beginning because we thought that might affect the attendance, but then um, we've done that. So I think with Alan's uh, case study, uh, he's going to look into a, a preferred learning styles of students and how we can sort of match them with our teaching styles. And the other side of the feedback was, how well are the students engaging? So this is both within the classroom and also outside, always been concerned and sometimes we're not sure. Um, so Ethan's study is again going to be on um, the way we deliver and um, the student engagement levels, okay? So I think um, now I will hand over to um, Alam and then after that will be Ethan to present their uh, findings. Uh, thank you, Hindia. I, I hope you will control the slide. Is that right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank, thank you all uh, for joining this session. Uh, I'd like to uh, share uh, some of the experience that I have actually acquired over the last uh, two semesters um, that uh, how learning styles can be used uh, in, in teaching uh, so that uh, students' experience can be improved. First of all, I'd like to give you a brief uh, overview of the learning styles, so where it has started and how it has been used in different disciplines. Well, I think learning styles started uh, quite uh, some time ago in uh, mainly in uh, psychology literature. So where uh, psychologists are trying to find out uh, how people can, trying to understand how people can uh, learn uh, more easily, right? Uh, and also based on the literatures, uh, uh, based on the literatures in psychology and later on in other disciplines as well. So there is a like concrete uh, theory of learning styles and based on the learning styles, what it says is that people, ap people approach a learning situation like that can affect how they learn, right? And they can, it can also affect their performance as well as their results. So what is the conclusion from that theory is that, you know, people's performance is not only just related to their intelligency, but also like it is also related to the environment where they learn uh, information. So that's why I think uh, based on the literature, uh, based on the uh, literature, I think uh, there are uh, many learning strategies 
and learning preferences uh, are, are already there. And those strategies and preferences are used to describe uh, a person's preference to one type of learning environment or other. And also this type of learning styles uh, and strategies are, are, the, are used to describe the way in which a learner, learner can choose or prefer uh, to interact with different learning tasks in the environment. So even though Learning style has been used in many disciplines, including education, especially for learning new languages, uh, in psychology, in medicine uh, recently as well, like how uh, medical students can learn about uh, uh, new uh, uh, experimental things. So, uh, however, there are some like uh, uh, mixed views about the existence of learning styles. Uh, so many uh, people claims about the efficiency of the learning styles. And also there are some counter claims as well. Uh, however, I'm on the, uh, on the other group like uh, who believe uh, in this uh, learning styles. So if you go to the next slide, Vindya. Okay, so let me uh, tell, talk about uh, the learning styles and the education. Well, I think, there are many uh, recent studies shows that uh, there is a relationship uh, between uh, like uh, learning styles uh, and uh, the students' performance. Well, I think students' learning styles is related to their performance in different learning environment. And also, you know, if a teacher or academics, if they can adjust their teaching styles accordingly, then student experience can be improved. Uh, that has been already evidenced through the literature. Uh, and uh, if you can uh, press the next one, and then, you know, one can identify and match the learning styles of their students and adjust their testing styles that can help the students to improve their like performance. So what it does tell us that like, if we use like uh, the learning styles, if we can identify the learning styles for our students, and if we can match the learning styles uh, with our teaching styles, that can not only help the students performance, but also it can help the students to be able to more versatile learner uh, in the sense that uh, they can have some experience in, in both their uh, favorite environment as well as uh, non-favorite environment. So, well, I think uh, in terms of uh, like our perspective, like as an uh, academics in the engineering discipline, uh, well, we all know that uh, engineering uh, education uh, involves uh, many things uh, that, for example, it involves uh, the development uh, and the design and manufacturing and operations of engineering and scientific facts. And we always uh, try to adapt uh, like very uh, different of very diverse uh, like practices in our teaching uh, so that uh, like our students can get uh, the most of, out of it. Uh, and also since it involves like uh, many things that uh, ranges from like uh, theory to the laboratory investigations. So that's why we always have to actually adapt like new styles or new teaching approach uh, in our uh, like uh, teaching. So therefore, uh, I believe there is a scope to utilize the learning style theory for improving learning experience for engineering students as well. So even though it has been proven in other disciplines, but in this action research, so I'm trying to find out whether there is any like efficacy of learning styles if we adopt in engineering discipline. So now, so based on this actually uh, like uh, understanding, uh, so we have come up with a like motivational research question, uh, which is how does the adoption of the teaching style based on the preferred preferential learning styles impact on the academic performance? So to find out the answer to this uh, question, uh, we have actually uh, framed a number of objectives uh, that we want to uh, identify. Uh, first of all, to identify the dominant learning styles among different learning style preferences in an engineering module. In our case, we have used information system management module uh, to do this action research. Another objective is to investigate 
the differences among the learning style preference in terms of genders. So we have a very like good proportion of uh, like uh, male and female students. So we want to see whether there is any uh, significant differences in terms of uh, their preferred learning styles in these two groups. And also we would like to like analyze the relationships uh, between the learning styles and the academic performance, whether there is really a correlation between these two or not that we want to see. So now, uh, well, I think as we know, we actually learn things in different ways. It varies individual to individuals. Uh, and uh, in many cases, we know like uh, students learning style preference show how well students can learn materials uh, in, in, in different modules, right? So if we talk about learning inventories, like how we can identify our students' preferred learning styles, there are many actually models which we call learning uh, inventories. So it is a kind of test that can allow you to assess uh, your students' like learning preferences, okay? So rates learning inventory is one of them. Uh, so I have used uh, this uh, model uh, for my action research. Uh, it involves six forms of learning styles. First of all, uh, visual learning styles. So with these styles, you know, people uh, learn by seeing things, yeah? And also uh, with auditory learning styles, uh, people learn by hearing uh, things, for example, uh, by listening or by speaking activities, uh, for example, the classroom discussion, uh, some lectures, listening to lectures and so on. The other group is the kinesthetic one. Uh, here in this group, people learn by doing things or experiencing things or by being involved practically or physically in the classroom activities. For example, it can be like some kind of field trip or it can also involve, uh, it can, another example can be like role playing in the classroom and so on. Tactile is uh, another uh, learning styles. Uh, so with this style, people learn best when they study, uh, when they have the opportunity uh, to do something like, uh, like physically, like hands-on experience. For example, uh, students can like uh, build some models or uh, do some laboratory experiments. So this kind of uh, styles. And another group is the group one. Uh, so in this uh, learning styles, people learn more easily when they study with other people, like as a group. Uh, as an example, we can talk about like, um, like group, group project work, or also we often give students to do some like uh, group activities uh, in the classroom. Uh, for example, uh, we have used uh, like breakout uh, uh, event uh, in our live sessions to make a small groups and then uh, allow students to work together to do to solve some problems and so on. Uh, with the individual learning styles uh, in this category, people learn best when they work alone. That means some students, they prefer to work alone. That means they learn uh, best of when they study by themselves. Uh, for example, uh, we can talk about, uh, we can give some example about like, uh, we, we often ask students uh, to do some uh, like problems during our tutorial sessions, yeah? So in that case, most of the students do them, uh, solve the problems by themselves. And also online quizzes is another example of this category. Uh, in the next slide, I would like to talk about a bit more about the methodology that, ha that have been used in this action research. So this research involves uh, data collection and uh, we collect data in different ways. First of all, as I have said that I have used uh, the rates uh, model, uh, which, is a, which has a set of questionnaires and that has been actually uh, asked uh, to our student participants uh, by using uh, Kion Plus. Uh, and also we collect student feedback uh, quite often, uh, almost every live, live lectures uh, by using Mentimeter. Uh, as Vindya mentioned earlier that I know our students uh, always prefer to give feedback uh, when, uh, when the feedback method is anonymous. So Mentimeter is one of the, uh, one of the, one of the tool. And another uh, data we have used uh, in this experiment is the exam results. 
So we have also collected all the results at the end of the semester and then uh, find uh, the correlation. And all those data has been analyzed uh, statistically, uh, like uh, as a uh, quantitative method. And also finally, we have applied our self-reflection method uh, to actually uh, validate uh, the outcomes uh, from the data analysis, uh, as well as uh, our uh, understanding, uh, our reflection uh, from how we have delivered our teaching over the semester. So in the next slide, uh, I would like to uh, give you a brief idea about how we have collected the data and uh, pre-processed the data before we conduct the uh, statistical analysis. So in the rates model, it has a 30 questions in total. Uh, and uh, there are five questions for each learning category. So we have six categories, that's why it's 30 questions. And these questions are grouped according to each learning style. And each question, when we get the response from a student, then this each response will have a numerical value uh, from one to five. And you can see a snapshot of the like uh, response from our students. Uh, we have 30 questions and you can see like uh, each question's response uh, value is uh, from one to five. And also uh, from the rates model, uh, it also has a self-scoring sheet. Uh, we use that self-scoring sheet, as you can see, as a snapshot at the bottom uh, to compute the score for each of the learning category. So in this uh, slide, what I'm showing here, so we have the student response in the, in the middle Excel sheet, and we use this self-scoring uh, sheet to compute uh, individual categories like scores for that individual uh, uh, participant. And then uh, in the next slide, uh, so once we have collected all the data and uh, pre-processed the data, then we have actually uh, done some statistical analysis. First of all, uh, we have done uh, some descriptive statistics, for example, to compute uh, the mean of the uh, scores for individual categories, the standard deviation, mean, max, and so, so on. So we have uh, like 110 uh, like student, uh, students uh, who responded to our questionnaire. And from this uh, table, what we can see that uh, if we look into this table, the main values, uh, we have the auditory category uh, where like we can see the highest uh, mean score we have for this category. That means uh, most of our students actually have their preferred learning style is the auditory. And we can also see the tactile is the second uh, largest one uh, and the visual and kinesthetic as well. So we have chosen these two auditory and tactile, the most preferred learning style in that group of students. Well, I think this is just a descriptive statistics. Uh, it does not really tell the significance or details about uh, the findings, uh, but it can give us some general idea. But uh, we need more detailed actually statistical analysis. And that's why we have done uh, further analysis. We have done hypothesis testing by using one way and over. So in this, uh, in this analysis, what we have done that we have considered a null hypothesis that there is no significant differences among the group main that we have seen in the previous slide, right? And also we have chosen the uh, like uh, alternative hypothesis. Uh, in this uh, hypothesis, uh, we assume that at least one group differs significantly uh, than the overall mean of the other groups, yeah? So if you look into this table, uh, what we can see, especially if you look into the uh, values of alpha, which is the p-value, uh, like, uh, and we can see that uh, that p-value is uh, much lower than uh, the threshold value that we have chosen, which is 0 0.05. So 0 0.05, 0 0.05 is the scientific, scientific like uh, threshold value uh, to do some statistical analysis. So based on this alpha value, based on the p-value, so it can uh, suggest us that uh, if you can uh, like press one more uh, key when there, yes. So you can actually suggest a high level of confidence that the null hypothesis does not give an adequate model for the data. So what does it mean by that? So it does tell us that there is no reason for us 
uh, to say that all the means for all the categories are equal. Yes, that means we reject the null hypothesis. So that means uh, the means are different. If we look uh, even further, uh, I think in the previous slide a bit, uh, yeah. So if you look into the F uh, test result, uh, again, we can see uh, that the F test value result is uh, higher than the F critical value, which also suggests us that we reject the null hypothesis, right? That means uh, the means are not uh, same for all the categories uh, we have considered. In the next slide, so what we have, first of all, we have find out uh, like what are the measure uh, like learning styles in that group. Then we further on to find out whether uh, if there is any significant differences in the major learning styles between our male students and female students. So that's why we have also done some independent sample t-test uh, about uh, genders. And again, from this table, you can see that if you look into the category like auditory, kinesthetic, tactile, and other categories, um, then you can see the alpha value is much higher than the threshold that we have chosen, which is 0 0.05, yeah? So, and if you look uh, specifically into the auditory and tactile that we have found, these are the preferred styles for this group of students, we can tell that there is no differences between our male students and female students of that measured learning styles. However, uh, if, you, if you press the next one uh, and next one as well, however, if you look into the visual one, uh, it does tell us that there is a variations of that category on the visual one. Uh, well, I think we don't know exactly why there is a difference, a significant differences between our male students, female students, uh, we don't know. But as far as, uh, as far as uh, like the measure preferential learning style that we have considered auditory and tactile, uh, we can tell that there is no differences between uh, male students and female students. Uh, next, yes, uh, yeah, as I said, okay. So now, first of all, we have found out the measure preferred skills uh, in this group of students. And then we have found out whether there is any significant differences between our male students and female students. And then we want to see uh, like whether there is any correlation between the learning styles and the academic performance of this module. And that's why uh, we have done uh, some correlation test here. So as you can see from this uh, table that there is a strong uh, like, uh, like correlation, uh, linear correlation of the auditory learning styles. So we see 0.9 on, and also uh, we can also see the visual one as well. This is also, there is also a strong correlation, uh, not strong as the auditory, but it has some linear correlation uh, with the visual style as well. And also there is also a correlation with the tactile style, uh, though it is not that strong as auditory, but uh, we can tell that there is a correlation between uh, the performance uh, of the students as well with the learning styles, uh, which is tactile and auditory, and as well as visual that are found in our analysis that these are the measured learning styles. Well, I think uh, before I summarize this one, I would like to just uh, emphasize one thing. So based on the self-reflection, you know, with the last two or three semesters, we have been delivering lectures by using our uh, like uh, video lectures. We are recorded video lectures. We are giving our recorded video lectures to our students. Yeah, from that point, so we can conclude that I think most of the teaching actually we have provided uh, over the last couple of semesters, especially this semester for this module is the auditory. Like we are giving like recordings. Yeah, that means we can conclude that there is a math, the correlation that we have found based on our statistical analysis has some like meaning based on our self-reflection. Okay, now I would like to conclude. Well, I think uh, the learning style questionnaire that we have used based on race model that can help academics like us to understand our students' learning preference a bit. Like we can know like what is the preferences that most of our students has and that can help us to adapt ourselves, how we can want to deliver information. 
it can also help our students to soak up knowledge on some topic and not others, yeah? So that means we need to adjust our teaching styles accordingly. So one thing I would like to highlight here that we do not need to ask our students what is there. They do not need to know their learning, preferred learning styles. But if we know by our, ourselves, then we can adjust ourselves to give them a better experience. So as based on our initial results, what we can say that, so there is a relationship between the learning styles and academic performances. And also uh, we believe that students have like different preferential learning styles and which can have some effect on their experience uh, in learning. Thank you. So I would like to ask my colleague, uh, Ethan, to uh, give him give his presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alam. Uh, Vinya, uh, before I start, would it be possible if I share my screen because there are some animations? Is it better? okay? Yeah, you can share them. Yeah. Yeah, can you see my share screen? Uh, yes, yes. I can. Okay, great, thank you, yeah. Okay. Hi, uh, everyone, so I'm Ethan. So apart from what you have seen from the case study from Alam, so now I'm going to uh, present you the second case study, which is basically the modeling and prediction of students' progression in learning through these hybrid pedagogic methods, okay? So, um, the main motivation behind why we need this uh, kind of modeling and prediction is because since this pandemic, uh, there is a need, as you can see from the reference, I got it from the United Nations. We need to focus on the long-term continuity of education delivery so that we can allow a resilience education across all the nations, right? Okay. So what you have seen in this uh, kind of diagram here is the way of how we can ensure a sustainable learning environment, right? So uh, apart from what I'd like to discuss here is in the part of this data mining of how we can obtain the data set so that we can do the analysis to check whether or not the teaching styles or the learning behaviors are they effective against students learning engagement and their final academic performance. So in this, uh, in my case study, I'll be rather focusing on indirectly looking into students' behavior of you know, the learning. So it's not true by getting the data set from questionnaires or surveys, but it's rather through observationals or through their exams. So their kind of class test results or the mock exam even like the lab assessment, everything, all those information, I get it to run this modeling and prediction in order to check how good they are in terms of the students' engagement in the lecture and also their final performance. So all these informations will be used basically apart from statistical analysis for this uh, analysis mechanism. I also perform this neural network. So one sort of this machine learning apart from this behavioral modeling, to see how good they are in terms of the uh, prediction and modeling through the student's assessment. And finally, the outcome all, all for all of these assessments will be translated into a new pedagogic method or a revised knowledge or pedagogic method that will always help us to improve the quality of education across the universities, right? So uh, what I'm going to present is the module, the TNE module is based on this uh, mixture of pedagogic methods. So I'll just briefly recap again from what uh, Queen Mary has adopted from uh, this, uh, you know, uh, what Vinya has presented earlier. So we have these three uh, different approaches on top of this Bloom's taxonomy. So we have asynchronous in addition to synchronous learning. So we adopt this anytime, anywhere else basis. And students, they will have either live or recorded session for the lectures based on the different weeks. As uh, Vinya mentioned, we have four uh, teaching blocks. So these are the examples, as you can see. Then we have these flipped classrooms, 
and we have pre-recorded and live lectures for the blended learning. Then apart from that, we have cognitive learning as well, because uh, for all the kind of module uh, students are learning, let's say in the current semester, there's a prerequisite for students to fully understand the module where they have learned these some bits of the fundamentals in the previous semester or last year. So this cognitive learning mechanism is to help them to bring up the ideas so that they can start learning, let's say, Java programming, because they have learned procedural programming before or in the last semester last year, so they can just pick up very quickly without having too much trouble in terms of their learning. So what we are focusing for this uh, in this Queen Mary is we do not want the student to just learning by memorizing the solution, but always encouraging to have them to have this cooperative and problem-less best learning with the lecturers together in the live sessions. So now, back to the questions, how uh, I can check, evaluate the students engagement and their learning. So how basically to check the effectiveness of the adopted this kind of pedagogic methods. So the first step definitely is to obtain the data sets. So in terms of the data sets, apart from getting the result from the mock test, uh, lab assessments, and any other kind of mechanisms, uh, our university, we have adopted this uh, echo trade system lecture recording system. So it's a lecture recording software. Apart from just uh, we uh, prepare the recordings, there are some information metrics in terms of the data set, such as the attendance, how students engage very well with the, you know, the platform and during the lectures and how the number of video views, everything, all those information that are available being recorded in these uh, data set or Ecos 360 platforms. So I use all of this information to do my modeling, right? So apart from this data collection, so as I mentioned, I use the assessment information such as the lab and the class test because uh, I the main reason why I use the class test is last uh, last year, uh, I've, uh, I submit this as part of my one of the conference paper as well. So the final exam is not yet available. So I only can use the class test to do the prediction. So this is what the reason why I use the class test. Then the final step is I perform two kind of analysis. The first one is statistical analysis because this provides a kind of fundamental mechanism to validate some finding, then I can only perform the prediction using neural networks, right? So in terms of this statistical analysis, I won't go into much detail. So the step one is I will perform this multiple regression analysis as what I have here that there are dependent variable and independent variable, okay? The, so the dependent variable will be like, you know, what I'm going to predict, which is the class test or the final exam, for example. So how to predict this class test? So based on the information I have already, so I make some kind of hypothesis, I can think that, okay, class test can be predicted based on uh, the data sets I obtain, such as the lab score, the lab assessments, how well students in terms of their engagement in the lecture. So all these engagement and the attendance metrics, they are available in the Echo 360 recording platform. So I just use all those data sets to make some kind of regression analysis with the class test. Then I use this information to perform correlation coefficients. So don't worry about this uh, formula. So I will explain how is it those two variables, uh, I can use it for the correlation as you can see in the results, right? So the first thing first with regards to the results for this multi-regression analysis, right? Don't worry about the values, but just to focus on the alpha or in other words, the significance. So any values that lies before 0 0.05 or in other words, 95% confidence interval. So I'm very confident with some level of findings here. So it's uh, 0 0.05, as you can see, all those values are less than 0 0.05. That means that all these information I use the lab, one to lab four, 
the results, the total engagement metrics, and the attendance, they are a good predictor for the class test. So that means that I can use all this information to predict the class test. So this is just a kind of verification. So the second analysis is the uh, correlation analysis. So I forgot to mention about what's this and this and this, but don't worry, it's just to check, you know, the verifications, right? So the next one is about correlation analysis. So this is another thing I found out is quite uh, interesting. So the correlation analysis is to check how good they are in terms of two variables, like let one and the class test, for example, if the value is higher approaching one, that means that let one's score affects the class test score much uh, well. So you can see the values are basically increasing. If you look at the class test with, in relation with the lab one, lab two, and lab four, and so forth. So that means when students, they are progressing from lab one to lab four, so all these uh, correlations are increasing because uh, in my class test, I have more questions from the lab four. So if students scores well in lab four, that means you can see the correlation is quite high, but because not much question comes from lab one, and then it will be quite low. Or in other words, if student doesn't do well in lab one, so we can have this kind of negative correlation, for example. So this is to help us to know how these correlation analyses can see uh, different aspects of the input of the assessment can affect the final class test score or the final exam. And one thing is that the attendance metrics is the highest with the correlation score apart from these uh, labs. So that means students, if they are attending the lectures and also these are attending both the recorded video lectures as well, that will bring up their class test results because class test is also comes from the part of the lecture as well. So we can see there are some kind of correlations there. And so in the final, before I go to the conclusion, so all those information, I can use it for neural network modeling. So basically these are kind of the uh, formulations I use for these uh, modeling of students progression in learning. So all these are uh, kind of information, basically in other words, is the behavior of their kind of learning, but it's already being translated into numbering terms. Like you can see the attendance uh, interactions and number of video views. So that are kind of their behavior, which are already mapped into a numbering scheme. So you can see in these results, these are the example of neural network modeling. So in terms of how good they are, it's not really good in terms of the performance, but it's not too bad either. So it's marginally acceptable where I reach the value of 0 0.6 of this prediction of students' behavior in learning. And to verify the output, you can see that at initial point, the results are quite high in terms of the errors, but the errors are gradually become lower and lower when the iteration uh, elapses. So you can see this neural network modeling is basically a good kind of approach to do the prediction. And just to make a conclusion, what I can say is this education modeling settings, just using a very uh, fundamental of neural networks provides a very good kind of contribution in evaluating these students' academic performance. So with this kind of neural network modeling, we can check whether the pedagogic approach, uh, we can help, uh, we can identify those different pedagogic approach that can affect the students' progression in learning, and we can improve it accordingly. Yeah, so uh, that's all for my presentation. Uh, just for information, uh, all this method is uh, already being published in one of the conference this year as well. Right, thank you. So I'll pass it to Vinya. Thank you, uh, Ethan and Alam. Uh, I know, uh, apologies, um, Christine, are we, we running over? Just we are very quick um, conclusions, just to say that um, from um, Alam's study, we looked at um, the different learning styles based on the feedback we received 
And um, so it, it, it takes effort to adjust your teaching styles, but sometimes it may be worth doing so. And then as Ethan's study showed, um, a really good to uh, keep reviewing your student engagement, identifying issues and adjust what you're doing. And finally, we do have in this era, we do have a lot of data available, a lot of technological advancements, and it's all about finding what best suits your uh, requirements, just not only now, but going forwards as well. So that is all. I know we ran over, um, many apologies for that. So hope it was useful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's very interesting. I guess we have time for a few questions for three minutes of questions. So if anyone has No, I would questions. I would honestly sorry. <laughs> sorry to butt in here, but I, I would prefer we moved on, I think, so that there's a bit of slack for the other speakers as well. Okay. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah. <laughs> well then sorry. thank you for the presentation. <laughs> very